Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Um, so my name's Liam Young. I'm um, uh, what I loosely describe as a speculative architect, um, which what that means is I don't design buildings, but rather I work between documentary and fiction to tell stories about the global and urban implications of technology. So we borrow from techniques from film, from fiction, from performance to collect and visualize stories of cities, both real and imagined, to engage audiences with the strange ways that technology is changing our world. So what we're gonna do tonight is a, is a live storytelling mix where we're gonna travel around the dark side of our luminous screens to see the shadows cast by our glittering cities of technology. Uh, pull the lever, Ennis. Tonight, I'm going to narrate for you a series of stories and myths of the post-Anthropocene. And we're going to go on a tour through a collection of sites, documented moments and vignettes of a new kind of city. A city of this digital world that for tonight we're going to call City Everywhere. And in the landscapes of City Everywhere, there is no city and country. There is no center and periphery but they're just a continuous city of technology that stretched across the entirety of the planet. It'll be a selection of tales from the dark side of technology, an atlas of geographies and gadgets and objects that form a portrait of this emerging city. It will be a city symphony that's stitched together from documentary footage of real sites or the short fragments of speculative narratives that are developed out of them. And we're going to see this city everywhere from the back seat of a taxi. And we're going to head off on safari and the city operating system is going to ride shotgun beside us. And in this driverless car, we're going to travel through the atlas of sights that form the edges of this city. And we're going to see where our contemporary technologies have begun their lives. And then we're going to travel into the dense city core to see ourselves and the strange creatures that we're soon becoming. So here we are in our driverless taxi and the smart city is sitting beside us and it smells of hard drives and fiber optics and Red Bull soda and the electric motor hums and we rumble on quietly and while we weren't watching the city has been silently changing it's been getting tickled with technology it's been remaking itself for someone other than us and the city has invited us on this road trip across its technological skin and it's looking forward to showing us around to visit the sites and structures made for and entirely by its machines and we're going to trace these sites their edges their glitches and anomalies to see where these invisible machines bubble to the surface. And here is our first sight. And we spy out the window, the landscape sprawling into the distance. And the city wants to take us back to the beginning, to the beginning of the beginning, where seconds from zero 13.8 billion years ago, the creation story of lithium begins, a fundamental component in all the technologies that power our world. And from the spark of the Big Bang, 
to the flicker of an electron jumping from the battery on our phone, it was there at the dawn of time. And in this vast cloud of swirling cosmic matter, gravity and violent collapse, it gave shape to the sphere of the Earth and embedded within it traces of this lithium. And here we drive along the azure shores of the city's energy pools, through Chile and Bolivia, a land no longer of an indigenous population, but of evaporation ponds of the world's largest lithium mines. So this is the landscape that lies behind the scenes of the batteries that power our technology. And 70% of the world's lithium is buried here. And you cannot see it on the desperately flat horizon or access it by any public road. Its mystery is protected by its isolation. But through the eyes of a drone, we see our technology splayed out before us. And lithium development is not mining through extraction, but mining through evaporation. And a tessellated ocean of evaporation ponds where each shift in hue signals a rising concentration of lithium salts. And from above this earth, it all comes alive with the colors of lithium electricity. And another world away on a stage in California, Elon Musk, tech evangelist and entrepreneur, proclaims his vision for a green future, a world where everything will be solar in 20 years. But like most Silicon Valley preachers, he's presenting just one kind of future, a seductive future, a hopeful future, but at the same time, it's a decidedly uncomplicated one. And now, Elon Musk must literally buy Bolivia and evolve it as the new Dubai. Because if the future is electric, if the future is Elon Musk and his Tesla fuel dreams, then the future is buried here beneath the salt flats of Bolivia. And now as we keep on driving, we see from a clearing in the point cloud mist, the cavernous landscapes of our ephemeral technologies. And it's in these massive mining excavations scattered on the edge of the world that our city everywhere begins and ends its life. And we each have a little bit of the gold or aluminium from these sites in the technologies in our pockets, charged and quietly vibrating. And Aboriginal Dreamtime narratives speak of a time when the ground was soft and creation beings shaped mountains and rivers when the rainbow serpent slinked across the ground to create a new river and when a wild dog came to rest to form a mountain. And now the lights of the city are washed out and the song lines walked by these ancient spirits are being sung anew with the tracks laid down by the beasts of the Australian mining industry. And the dreaming landscape that embodies the creation stories of Aboriginal Australians is overlaid with a vast infrastructure of resource speculation and financial fictions. And geographical survey planes track back and forth, laser scanning the earth, searching for the topographic anomalies that indicate pockets of undiscovered minerals. And the digital models of these landscapes are now linked live to the fluctuations of the gold price on the stock market. And as explosive diggers and drills have replaced the slow erosion of rivers and earthquakes, we're scoring our economy into the archeological record. And these massive excavations become a chronicle of the digital permutations and fluctuations that drive our modern world. And in these landscapes, we see vehicles just like ours that no longer have drivers, but that are just systems. And our own vehicle, keeps on driving and takes us deeper into the dust. And through the window, we look down on the rhythms of the human conveyor belts in Madagascar. One of the planet's most precious ecological treasures is now, of course, home to its poorest nations. And it raises difficult and complex questions about the relationship between necessity and luxury. And here, as the beat drops and the stage lights strobe, 
and a pop star flashes their designer bling for the camera in a flurry of choreographed dance moves. Another world away, in this hole in the ground in the wild west mining town of Ilakaka. Another choreography of bodies move in rhythm to dig dirt by hand out of a gemstone mine. And here, 70% of the world's sapphires are pulled out of the ground by the human conveyor belts of Madagascar's gem fields. So for such a remote island, it contains an extraordinary amount of high-value resources. And precious gems were deposited here by an ancient river that once flowed across Africa before a tectonic shift ripped it from the mainland to form the island of Madagascar. And the stones collected in a pocket along the twists and turns of the riverbed, resting patiently beneath 20 meters of sand and the future boom town of Ilikaka. And here, hidden amidst political uncertainty is the island's fragile and unique ecology. And it's being smuggled out illegally, boat by boat, gem by gem. And rare tortoises leave in rucksacks and forests are carved into $1 million rosewood beds to be sold in China. And precious stones are shoveled from the earth and smuggled onto the stage in pop star bling. And these digging machines excavate the majority of the world's gemstones. And in these illegal mines, it's cheaper to pay 20 men in rice than it is to maintain and fuel a mechanical conveyor belt. And a hidden black market supply chain connects these two choreographies from the lawless mine sites of Madagascar to the hip-hop music videos and celebrity red carpets across the ocean. And for the jewelry of City Everywhere, we've used the amount of rice the human conveyor belt consumes in a day to manufacture a precious stone that embodies the systems through which these worlds are intimately and profoundly connected. So the red Madagascan rice that's grown endemically on this treasured island is a staple food of the miners, and it's been collected locally and shipped to gem specialists for carbon analysis. Nice. And by subjecting the rice to extreme heat and pressure in the lab, it's formed into a synthetic stone encoded with the sum of the human conveyor belt's labor. We are gonna do what we do. And after manufacture, the gemstone has been set into a gold tooth, ready for that million dollar smile and the outrageous lyric. And from killer jewels to carrots to the nightclub, in the glare of this cheeky gold grin, we see ourselves, the cost of luxury, of beauty, and in a daily allowance of rice and 20 men shoveling at the bottom of a hole. And in our taxi, we continue to follow the breadcrumbs of technology, and we arrive at a village organized around metals and hardware components. And here, we see another group of villagers buried not by soil, but by collected piles of e-waste gathered in their houses. And these mines of discarded technology surround their living spaces. And they mine their domestic landscapes for lead, geranium, gallium, nickel, and copper next to the pot of noodles simmers the acid bath, flavoring metals and flavoring soup. And close by, our driverless taxi now rolls up to the shores of the radioactive lake of Inner Mongolia. And this lake sits beside the world's largest rare earth mineral refinery. And we take a selfie with our phones and we see our reflection in the mirrored screen because the material to polish its glass and run all its software makes this very lake. And in this single luminous surface, we see ourselves and this black, black earth. And from this black sludge, we've made a vase for the machines, a vase for the city to thank it for showing us around. It's a set of vases made from the amount of radioactive waste created in the production of three objects, an iPhone, a MacBook, and a Tesla electric car battery. And now we leave the, the vase landscapes behind and the city takes us to where all this raw material is refined and shaped into the familiar objects that fill our lives. 
and almost all of the world's Christmas decorations are here. And that tree lighting your lounge, those decorations hanging from your ceiling, that novelty stocking filler you bought for your child, is all made in factories and landscapes like this one. And they're made by the human machines of the city, orchestrated by efficiency algorithms. So in city everywhere, these are the real robots of our digital technologies, where the body is matched in speed to the conveyor belt that turns in front of it. And here we find 90% of the world's electronics. And we brand our technologies with terms like cloud, air, and featherweight. But in reality, they're violently wrenched out of the earth. And our personal electronics tend towards the invisible, but they also conjure in their shadows an undeniable gray mountain, a one kilometer deep pit, a 10 square kilometer radioactive tailings lake, an endless conveyor belt, all counterweights to the apparent immateriality of computing, communications, and electric energy. And in a way, the infrastructures of the digital world have extraordinary implications on our material experience. These are the architectures behind the screen and beyond the fog of the cloud, the physical outputs of our digital engagement with the world. And this collection of post-human architectures and spaces reverberate across multiple frequencies, multiple forms of sight and experience. And in this same area of the city, a camera flashes, a model pouts, and a sharp cheekbone in the whip of a hip catches the eye of the catwalk. And fast fashion's rolling tide dumps mountains of cheap clothing on the high street shores. And objects of desire, worn for one wild night, are destined to be discarded. And here, we pick at a thread on the loose garment of our clothes, and we unravel it across continents from wardrobe to warehouse, from factory to field, in search of the landscape behind our runway dreams and street blue jeans. So before we make them, before we wear them, our clothes make journeys of 10,000 miles across the planet in their process of production. And the byproduct of this pace and scale is the destruction of the very thing that brought this industry to Southeast Asia in the first place. And here we meet the last generation of the master weavers, a group whose skills now die with them. And the apprentices they would once train now man the rumbling mechanized looms of global fashion, raw cotton plugging their ears, deaf to the din of the world around them. And we visit the last real gold thread maker, an alchemist who lovingly tweaks the machine his grandfather made, resisting the move to synthetic, cheap, and fake threads used by all the other companies around him. And spanning from fashion victims to victims of fashion, for the cloth of City Everywhere, we weave a collaborative textile with the last gold thread maker and one of the last true master weavers in India. An audio from a series of interviews with these endangered craftsmen and the sound of their looms is translated into a binary pattern and woven into our cloth. And the textile becomes an archive encoded with the skills and stories of a dying craft and woven from the same hands it's trying to remember. And to make the thread for the textile, we follow the container ships, the ships that bring the fast fashion to our shores, and after only 25 years are then discarded to wash up in India and Bangladesh, where they're broken up and salvaged in the shipbreaking yards. And here we collected fragments of this raw steel from the Bangladeshi shores, and we cut out of these rusting carcasses and dead ships the bones of these machines to form the core of the gold thread. And it's a textile archive 
that's born from the skeletons of the industry that brought it into being. And this gold cloth now covers a young Indian textile walker. And she walks slowly on a sacred procession through the Anthropocene, from her home village amongst the cotton fields to the huge mills and factories of the vast textile industry. And as she walks, she's gradually wrapped in the glittering gold textile, bearing witness to a series of transformations of weaving, dyeing, sewing, and pressing. And her journey suggests the walk along the fashion catwalk, the path our disposable fashion takes as its global production path winds its way across the planet and the path so many women have taken before her, moving from the village to the factory. And her journey ends as she's completely cocooned, standing on the huge container port amongst the mega container ships that will export her to the west. city everywhere cannot be described as a single point on the map. Our technologies cast shadows that stretch across the earth. And now, as we keep on driving, we pack up all the objects and materials produced in these sites, and then we send them off in ships around the world. And we glance over at the computer-controlled container fleet of the mega shipping industry that now navigates autonomously based on GPS satellites and the ship captain and the portside crane operators have also been made obsolete. And around the busiest shipping lane on the planet, where the Arctic Ocean and the ice have all melted to open up a new mythic shipping lane, the Siberian coastline stands empty, filled with the unmanned beasts of global trade. And we see a lone engineer and her dog head back from a maintenance run like a lighthouse keeper, just her, the horizon, and the creaking cranes. Her body repurposed as a component in the landscape-scaled robot that stacks the containers, ready for transport, bringing our goods all the way home. And as we travel across this pixel sea, we hear a story of a strange new land on the horizon. This is about the Sandy Island mystery that was in the Sydney Morning Herald. Sandy Island was actually um, found on Google Earth. So the city tells us a story of Sandy Island, a collection of dark pixels, GPS coordinates, hyperlinks and stories. On the horizon it's just empty but here we hear a tale of an island that was originally chartered by the whaling ship Velocity back in 1876. But for uh, the island, it's long been what's called an evidence-doubtful landmass. It's a place perhaps originally recorded to be a trap to support a map's copyright, or it was a mislabeled pile of volcanically ejected pumice that was seen drifting on the horizon. But whatever this cartographic apparition was, it remained visible in the Google Earth maps and models of the city everywhere until an Australian research vessel confirmed its non-existence during a 2012 expedition to survey the ocean floor. So up until that point, to a world of Google explorers and hyperlink adventurers, Sandy Island was just as real as any other place they visited online. So in this city everywhere, if the places and spaces exist solely in the mediums through which we experience them, then they become just as real as any other. Geographies with a hashtag, fading in and out. And as the ship pulls up on the shores of the Amazon Fulfillment Center, we see another landscape of machines stretching out before us. And here it's the Amazon storage bins and the endless shelves of the fulfillment centers. 
and the Amazon bookshelves are stacked based on complex sorting algorithms that's engineered around sales frequencies and buying patterns. And we watch as the Amazon robots rush through the stacks, navigating from book to book, filling their orders following the most efficient route generated for them by the navigational programming. And in a way, this is the library of City Everywhere. Not organized around Dewey Decimal systems, but by buying habits and aggregated data sets. It's a library that isn't organized for us. And we follow the Amazon Prime drone that's zipping about above us. And we head to the drone parts of the city where we see the drones have become as ubiquitous as pigeons. And they follow us around, always with a smile. And the air is filled with the digital confetti of our every desire. And the skin of the city is warm, freckled with a thousand lights, winking just for us. And we see the traffic lights flocking at rush hour. And we see the Amazon drill delivery drones and their packages rain down in an Amazon hailstorm. And here the rumble of drone propellers have become a new natural soundscape to the city of a new generation. All the dogs in the city are walked by drones now, the city says. Think of the time saving. And in the distance, we see a network of drones that monitor the wayward youth of a London council estate. And we watch as a young girl has hacked and decorated her own drone and uses it to pass notes to her boyfriend trapped in the tower opposite. And like kids passing notes in an old fashioned classroom, they scribble messages on the drone and they send it back and forth between the towers. And in this near future city, drones form both agents of state surveillance, but also become co-opted as the aerial vehicles through which two teens might fall in love. And another drone, armed with a dildo, disrupts a Russian parliamentary session. Another, armed with a different kind of cylindrical object, zips overhead en route to attack a village in a country half a world away. And now we're getting closer to the sites, the city that, that we find ourselves in and we head to the residential districts and the taxi takes us to the Samsung Towers and we put our ears to the cool beveled aluminium door of one of the apartments and we listen to the conversation inside. Through the door we can hear someone called Jury drop her Samsung Galaxy SX phone onto the kitchen table and we hear it chime softly as it makes contact with the Samsung Kui smart power charging mat. And we hear a scream down the hallway at her husband raising her voice over the Samsung air conditioner. Why does the new TV say LG on it, she says. What do you mean, because it's made by LG, he replies. She screams at him, are you, are you trying to get us thrown out, she says. Our lease is up for review in three months and you bought an LG TV into a Samsung housing block. What the hell are the neighbors gonna say? And we look at the city. It just shrugs and glares at us with a million sensor eyes. It uses Apple. South Korean woman got a rude awakening when she left her robot vacuum to do the cleaning while she took a nap. The vacuum cleaner reportedly mistook the woman for dust, locked onto her hair and tried to suck it up. The vacuum suction was far from gentle, and wretched the woman from her slumber. The woman's hair then became entangled in the cleaning device. The woman, who has not been named, was unable to free herself and called the fire department with a desperate rescue plea. So in another one of the apartments, 
we see a robot vacuum cleaner that's attacked one of the apartment owners. And here, we see in, in, the, in the kitchen of the apartment, Heinz was forced to apologize after a QR code on a ketchup bottle linked to hardcore porn site, Fundorado. And now we keep on driving and we head into the beating, purring, and whirring heart of the city. And we drive along the aisles of the Facebook machines, past all of our messages, photos, inane chatter, hopes, dreams, desires, and darkest fears. And the electric cars have given way to the whir of cooling fans. And it's not a grand cathedral, it's not a great library, but at a time when our collective history is digital, this is our generation's cultural legacy. And perhaps we'll soon write soliloquies for the server aisles, like we once did for rolling hills. And couples might steam up the car windows parked in the artificial moonlight of vast data complexes. And power plant fog hangs heavy in the air, and it looms like storm clouds. And hidden, Within the server stacks, the city wants to take us to visit the renderlands and the data farms. And we drive on through the Indian quarter of the city. And the, in the design studios of the West, architects and directors sketch out their designs for imaginary cities. But in India, across the other side of the planet, a massive anonymous workforce turn these wireframe renderings into the high fidelity digital architectures of developer renderings, video games, and Hollywood blockbusters. And the city introduces us to one of the render farm workers called Prakash. And he's making and shaping the digital worlds that we all inhabit. And Prakash has fallen in love with the digital model of a beautiful Hollywood actress after spending 14 hours a day endlessly rotoscoping, rendering, and compositing her into blockbuster films. And he's lovingly airbrushed across every pore on her face, every strand of her hair, as he 3D models her superhero silhouette, scene by scene, frame by frame. And by night, when the fluorescents are switched off and everyone else has gone home, he straps on his VR goggles and they walk hand in hand through the streets of a city he's collaged together for them from scavenged VFX movie models and the leftover 3D game assets that remain on Indian studio hard drives when a production is cancelled. The digital ephemera of popular culture fills our physical spaces and we drive through a utopia that exists in the thickness of the screen, a virtual city that stretches from Los Angeles to Bangalore a world of demolished landscapes and outsourced pixel projected dreams. And this is a physical world left behind when everything disappears into the lens of Google Glass or Oculus Rift. And in this city everywhere, modern film studios are an analogy for the urban spaces of the city, where we see a new type of architecture based on calibration crosshairs, stripped back to become the scaffolds and infrastructure for a digitally constructed world. An architecture that's lying in wait, ready for the premiere of a million animated movies that will illuminate its surface with color and detail. And the city is filled with the digital confetti that's projected just for us. And this is the future that technology promises us. So when we turn off 
this augmented world, the bespoke billboards of Minority Report's urban spaces or the tailored ads, navigational prompts and Tinder profiles of our track status updates, we'll see a green screen studio world where everything has become a screen. And we keep on driving through these renderlands and we visit another apartment, an augmented apartment in an up and coming area of the city where the renderings on developer billboards have become the inhabitable utopias of AR fueled gentrification. And inside one of the apartments, we hear a real estate agent that's showing a client around a digital construction site. And here, the physical shell just becomes a fix fixer upper canvas and building drebri and unsightly neighbors are hidden behind the rendered glow of our digital imaginaries. And the occupation of space is now reimagined on individual scales and each of us are tuned to our own architectural channel. Okay, so um, what were you thinking? Asked the real estate agent as Google image search boxes appear beside the door. So we have some lovely 21st century textures, early Floyd, classic Tilco, or for something really special, I can offer you one of our Ikea packs. Very eclectic, very tasteful, 100% uncustomized. And a day bed winks in and out of existence to be replaced by a set of tables in primary colors and a rectangular bookcase. Ooh, relax he says, and a billy, he exclaims. Ah, I can see that Sarah is a connoisseur, the agent says, and they tap some more buttons and a series of blonde and laminate objects start to appear around the space. A low Japanese style bed overlays the couch and he sinks down into it, his eyes glazed over in a pixel hue. And we jump back in our taxi. And we keep on driving and a dull roar now fills the cabin as we drive. And I wind down a window. And in the distance we can hear the audience going crazy. Have you ever been to a Hatsune Miku concert, the city says. She's the pop star of our generation. A pop star for, for the machine world. And Hatsune is a 3D projection with a larger fan base than most living musicians. And the crowd wave their glow sticks for a digital ghost of the city. Because Hatsune is the first animated pop star. And just like the Kardashians or the Hiltons or the bloggers and the Instagram stars, she's no physical presence. She's just a media construction. And to the beat of Hatsune's hologram, the young ravers dance with explosive contortions as they invent a new choreography that distorts their silhouette and disguises the proportions of their frame so as to evade body detection algorithms. And they do their makeup in the gloss black mirrored screens of their dead phones. And they reimagine their fashion cycles to follow the rate of Moore's law or the latest phone model or software update rather than a change in season. And they adorn themselves in anti-facial recognition makeup. And they develop new camouflage textiles and new hoodies that are designed to be invisible to the scanning technologies of the smart city. And their textiles reflect the light of CCTV laser scanners, creating exuberant glitches and distortions and disturbances in the data set. And just like them, we've always found the eccentric and the imaginary in the slippery spaces between the data points. And they keep dancing in the glow of the screen, searching for the wilds within the machine. And as we come to the end of our tour, we see burning on our screens in the taxi, the two words, hello world. It's a program that's a simple system 
designed to verify that a language or a software is operating correctly. It's the first word spoken by a new system. And Hello World burns onto the screen, announcing itself, telling us that everything is going to be just fine. But in a way, all these technologies never gave us this warning. We aren't sure how they got here, but we're certainly not going to let it leave. They're all just too seductive, too shiny, and too easy. And we see that our technologies, our buildings, our spaces are formed from this planetary scaled machine. An infrastructure so large, it's become invisible. A machine so often disguised, ignored, or forgotten by it beyond the gloss of the screen the seamless aluminium edge, or the glare of the pixel. And here, ideology rarely evolves at the same pace as our technology. And my watch tells me about a coffee machine it just met. And the city wraps us in a warm embrace. And the LEDs blink and the cooling fans spin and the streets are lined with sensors. And the electromagnetics hum. And it smells like it's gonna rain. And our faces are bright in the rolling glow of a rectangular screen, Aurora. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. And in the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. And in the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. And in the future, in the future everything, everything will be smart, will be smart connected, connected, and make and it, all, make better. it all, better. all better. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, make it all better. Thank you very much, Liam. Thanks. Incredible Thanks for performance. hanging through it. Wow, that's a really big crowd, actually. Nice one. Um, so in your uh, work, it, it seems to me that what you're doing a lot is digging in to like the really raw materiality of technology, like what it's made from and the way that it gets to us sure. in order to somewhat dispel the magic. Do you think, it, why is that an important thing to do, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I tried to talk about it with... Um, with Elon Musk, right? Like, so we we went to see the lithium mines just after he did his famous tech keynote where he announced the Tesla Powerwall, right? And and along with that product announcement, um, he also declared this vision for a, a twenty year future where everything is going to be solar powered. Um, and of course, it was hailed as one of the most visionary keynotes since Steve Jobs launched the iPod. Um, it spawned a million blog posts and. Um, editorial pieces um, and you know built the mythology of what this man has become um, uh, but what he didn't talk about or what he only gave kind of you know very small um, uh, notes to was where all the lithium that powers that future comes from um, and that's where we thought well let's go jump on a plane and go and see it you know boots on the ground rumble and and rummage through the real artifacts of what this image of the future, this dream of technology might actually be. Um, what we found is that, you know, if, if this future's gonna come true, Elon Musk basically needs to buy Bolivia, 
right? Like literally, he needs to buy this entire nation that has 70% of the world's lithium resources. Wasn't there a really bad James Bond movie about that as well, right? <laughs> yeah, probably, <laughs> probably. Um, if, they, if there wasn't, there should be. Um, uh, and it's not to say that that, that, that that relationship or vision or solutionist view of technology um, should be supplanted then by our old view and we should go back to oil and, and gasoline-powered cars. It's just to say that somehow we need to include in our discussions of these futures or we need to include in the presentation and cultural language around these technologies this idea of complexity, right? To say that it's not as simple as that. Um, as much as we would like it to be, actually, it's, it's quite messy. And maybe we want to sacrifice this entire pristine salt lake in Bolivia in order to create this future. But it should be on the table as a discussion point, right? right. Um, it, should, it should be fronted up before we're sold the product. Yeah, and I think that's, I mean, that's why we try and tell these stories, is to, is to find ways of engaging with complexity, right? To, to tell stories or myths of these new complexities of technology as a means to start to um, relate to them beyond the solutionist view that, that most technology is sold to us through. And in a lot of the, the places we visited just then, um, there were, you, you talked a lot about um, uh, old craft practices as well as ancient beliefs in, for instance, in, in uh, Aborigine Australia. Do you see the speculations and the myths you're building as a continuum of those stories, or is it to refresh us of the importance of remembering these histories? Warren on his opening was Warren Ellis on the opening was extolling remembering the old myths as a way of keeping knowledge alive, keeping the, the conversation alive. Yeah, I mean I think in part of um, kind of riffing off those mythologies of creation is to um, look at the ways that we've always related to the world, I suppose, right? But those those forms are never fixed. You know, the Aboriginal culture. I mean, I'm, I'm Australian, um, uh, and you know, I, I grew up with these stories. It's an oral tradition. There was no writing culture, so there's stories that are constantly changing and evolving. Um, you know, there's a creation story that talks about the white clouds moving in across the ocean, which was a falling to the sails of the tall ships of the English colonizers coming to the land. Um, there's a green ant dreaming, um, a new dreaming story, which was referring to uranium mining, um, the green stone and rock of, of uranium. So these ancient stories are being spun with the ghosts of technology. Um, and it suggests another way that we might relate to these things beyond um, uh, the artifacts of a consumer culture, right? Um, it suggests another way we might relate to them beyond just being sold to them, sold us them. Um, and we're interested in co-opting those forms and, and looking at those landscapes and the stories that come out of those landscapes as clues for how we can start to relate to this strange new Anthropocenic condition that I'm trying to be, narrate, trying to be narrating. Um, how can we relate to that differently? Um, and I think a couple of the things we've got in the festival, um, Yenna's performance comes to mind, the wor work of um, Manira al Qadiri and Sophia Al-Maria in the exhibition, are taking that same view, right? Seeing the human as part of a, almost a machine that is the earth that's been running for thousands of years and we're just a part of it and need to see the things we've pulled out of the earth as, a, as just a refiguring of that computer rather than necessarily a, a, a new thing that's come from nowhere, from no history. Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, again, but back to the lithium, like we wrote, um, we've got a book on the lithium story where we rewrote the creation story of lithium. It's called We Power Our Future from the Breast Milk of Volcanoes because the story of the creation of lithium um, for the indigenous people of that landscape involved this torrid love affair between volcanoes. Um, and they broke up and the tear, and they just had a, they just had a young baby volcano. Um, and the tears and breast milk of Tunapu, the mother volcano, mixed together and, co and, and condensed into this salt lake and formed um, the lithium field, right? So we literally, every one of us has in our pockets a piece of, uh, you know, a, 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 a packet of this tears and breast milk of this mythic volcano. And we, we built a, we've done a project um, that I didn't talk about tonight where we built a new battery um, in the shape of this volcano and, and um, uh, dripping in, in the, the coloured brine of lithium to talk about kind of a new 
material aesthetic or language through which we might describe some of these objects of technology which acknowledges the creation stories and the landscapes in which they come from, right? Um, and I think this question of, uh, I don't know how many designers are in the room, but this question of how we design our objects and our technologies, not based on how they might slide into our pockets or look in Beyonce's hand in the latest Apple commercial, but based on the, the landscapes they set in motion and the resources they distribute, I think is a really um, interesting question. I think part of trying to um, move into this direction where we, where we might collapse product design and landscape design into one discipline is, is the, the discussion of these stories, right? And the discussion of these myths to try and understand that these things all exist on this continuum. It'd be a real hard sell to my dean, I think, to try and get her to collapse those subjects. Um, we've got about uh, seven minutes, almost exactly seven minutes, for any questions from the audience. See shit. Any questions at all? Wow. Okay. Do you have any more questions, Toby? Yes, Toby. Toby. I hate the fact that he does that. He's the only person apart from my mum who calls me Toby. Really hate it. I, I, was, I, was, I said I wouldn't do it when I came here. I was like, oh, look, he's, he's curating this thing. Call him fucking Tobias. Um, um, almost uh, did. So tell me a little bit about your decision as an architect then to work with a sort of storytelling and performance as opposed to what we would, you know, most people I would imagine would consider the sort of the standard forms of architecture models or, 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 or static images and plans? Yeah, I mean, I just think, like, um, I mean, I don't know how many architects made it out tonight. Um, shout out. Um, uh, none good. Um, but um, we, you know, we you train longer to be an architect than you do a surgeon, right? Like, you can cut open someone's brain, tinker around um, in, in a shorter time span than it takes to to do someone's kitchen extension, uh, literally. Um, and it's a mentally slow discipline. Um, and it, it talks and operates through this very codified language of plans and sections that it takes that time to, that, that amount of time to understand how to read. So it's a very closed discipline. Um, a lot of people don't know what, what we do. Um, uh, and really, I think the ideas though that, that come out of kind of an urban design program are really fundamental to the to the understanding, experience, and shaping of our cities. So really, we've just been kind of trying to steal from other disciplines ways of communicating um, as a means to take architectural and urban ideas and put them out into the world with a force that might find traction um, and to try and connect to audiences that normally wouldn't be in a room like this one or the normal rooms that I end up talking to in architecture schools or wherever. Um, so the idea is that, you know, I'm now, I'm now based in LA and I run this program um, uh, in fiction and entertainment, um, the objective of which is to try and encode within the mediums of popular culture these critical stories about technology or our cities, and they operate like Trojan horses, kind of, you know, when you might be watching, you know, the new Blade Runner 2049 actually embedded in that landscape is um, an interesting formulation of what a city could be, right? Or a mythology or a... Um, a new story around a new technology, right? Um, uh, so I think it's our responsibility as contemporary practitioners of disciplines like architecture to find new ways to get outside the discipline and connect with um, much larger audiences. And that's really the motivation behind the co-option of fiction and storytelling as a medium of operation. Well, I also think that sort of the seizing of pop culture as a means of dissemination is quite interesting. And there's an increasing amount of practitioners that seem to be doing it, you know, because you can you've got sort of the uh, uh, critical technology movements and open sourcing and things like that, but that still requires some intentionality for someone to want to get engaged. They have to want to know how to code or whatever. But using pop culture as a way to enhance like people's engagement with the material world is quite an interesting thing to do, I think. And I was talking earlier about uh, with, with a group of people about um, magic as a form of social mediation. Right, The magic has this ability to... Or, or certainly at a time when people don't have faith in institutions, has an ability to uh, sort of present a collective faith in a system that's perhaps impenetrable. And I think a lot of the stuff we're seeing in the resurgence of magical narratives is happening in pop culture for that very reason, that it is a place of shared social being. Yeah, it's also the reason why like um, UFO sightings increase in times of crisis, right? Really? 
Um, yeah, it's like it's a it's a cause and effect, um, very clear relationship. You know, um, conspiracy theories pop up um, at times of um, civil unrest and um, uh, immense um, unease um, with the with with the world around us. And it's because we all need to find something that we can believe in, right? When we when we lose our faith in the traditional structures of power, we need to put that faith somewhere. So we might put it in a conspiracy theory or yeah. in little green men, because um, somehow it's easier to believe in that than it is um, the Trump apocalypse. Yeah, you know? exactly. It's like if you can't put faith in a real thing, perhaps there is something you just don't know that you can have faith in. Yeah, yeah. And that's I mean we we did. Um, uh, I mean these are all books from this series that I'm that I'm that I'm plugging here. But um, we did a, a, a story. Yeah, do some signing. Uh, we did a we did a, um, a comic called High Strange, which was set in um, the black military sites of the U.S. Um, and it was a, con new, a new conspiracy theory, but it was stitched together from real conspiracy theories that we had um, uh, collected from interviews with whistleblowers and ex CIA people and UFO abductees from from around the United States. Um, but really, what we were talking about was the way that. Um, the U.S. Um, used this active campaign of constructing um, folklore and UFO stories and conspiracy theories, and they would infiltrate UFO conventions and seed false narratives as a as a weapon of the Cold War, right? And really, what it is is a kind of weaponized folklore, right. where they're trying to um, create a new mythology. Um, that in that case was to scare the shit out of Russians thinking that USA had a secret UFO and, and evil weapon technology hiding underneath Area 51. Um, but you see that methodology can actually be repurposed in different ways, right? This idea of um, uh, kind of fiction machines um, being used with the same kind of clarity and sharpness as all the machines I showed on the production line um, where we co-opt the, the mechanisms of weaponized folklore and we might be able to use it for different ends. I think that's um, uh, really interesting. All right, we've got literally one minute. So if there's any question, now is your, it's literally the last chance ever. <laughs> ever. Hello? Hey man, just shout it. Okay. No, you missed it. We had the Anthropocene. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's over. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's the shortest geological period ever. It's, yeah, that's that's what happens now. Yeah, um, uh, the 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 post Anthropocene is what we're describing is um, uh, like if the Anthropocene. The, 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 I'm comfortable with the Anthropocene because it puts ourselves at the center of it, right? Um, and I guess what I'm talking about with the post Anthropocene is a context where we're not at the center of anything, but it's the the machines and the technologies we make which are, right? So the post Anthropocene suggests a world which is remade, not by us, but by technology. Um, uh, and that's kind of where I was trying to talk about um, uh, in, in some of these stories, right? And also the, you know, the conceit of the driverless car as being the vehicle through which we see these things um, is all to talk about these new subject positions which aren't human. Um, but are entirely machinic, and I think they character they characterize the post anthropocene um, yeah I, well, I think also I, well, just quickly, I read a, a thing last week i can 't remember who it was it was someone like Timothy Morton who was saying that as soon as the Anthropocene was recognized, it was over, like as soon as it was recognized as a thing, then that then it 's either coping or ignoring as a mechanism, which is a different type of mm. geology yeah i mean I, I was also I, mean, I thought we were, we were also um, talking about in the in the bar new um, subject positions which emerge um, in the context of the post-Anthropocene. And we've been making a whole series of films that are looking at new forms of narrative that don't revolve around human-centric storylines, right? Like the Where the City Can't See, which is where all that LiDAR scanning stuff is from, um, is a short film which is told from the perspective of a driverless car. Um, in the Robot Skies, another clip that I showed is, is entirely shot from pre -pro, uh, autonomous drones making their own filmic choices. Um, you know, an internet-connected fridge is a new character in a context, or in her, Scarlett Johansson voices an operating system, right? Like, I think these are all these strange new characters, creatures, um, and systems that we need to start relating to in, in new cultural ways um, in order to navigate the, the post-Anthropocene that I've trying to be narrating.
All right, we have to end there at 6.30. Thank you very much, uh, Liam Young, for joining us for your performance tonight. Thanks, guys. Thanks for hanging around. There's a screening of uh, Liam's film Renderlands at 8 o'clock in Studio 3, so please go there. And uh, later this evening, we've got Diederik Peters' performance at 9.30. Thanks. Thanks.